Welcome. Hi, Susan. Hi, Brian. Good to see you. Good to see you too. And good to see everybody that's listening in. This has really been interesting. I, I, I hope the people tuning in are, are enjoying this. And for us, trying to create something, we're all experimenting, even people visiting and, and people coming to do business. We're kind of like breaking new ground. And I think it's really interesting. And personally, I've found that uh, it's very social or it can be. And I think when people um, get used to this platform, uh, we can do this in the future and it'll get better and better. It's sort of like a place we can meet, almost like coming to a trade show, almost like coming to a booth. But what I like is like when you're sitting at, at someone's table, everybody at the table can see each other equally and we can have conversations. I like it. And uh, I think it'd be really interesting to have feedback from all the visitors. I like it too. And although my experience in trade shows has been as a jewelry designer and not as a gem person, a gem professional, mm -hmm. um, I like the, the social part of it. I know that, you know, when you have a booth, you have to sometimes like run over somewhere else to chit chat with the other vendors. And we've had plenty of time to talk um, amongst ourselves and, um, and still to be there for people coming and to have, you know, more than one pe person at your table at a time. So you can all, you know, be talking and learning about the same thing. I always enjoy that actually as a designer attending Tucson, like seeing other designers that I know say at your booth, Brian, and we're all chatting and they're looking at something and it, it inspires me to, you know, to see what they're looking at. And we talk about our designs. It's so, you know, I think that is one of the fun things about Tucson or about any show where you are, you know, it's social. Live and in person is always better. And it's essential to actually look at stones. I mean, it's difficult in this platform to, to buy stones, but at least we can make connections. And in the case where the world's kind of shut down, it is giving us a way to be there. And let's imagine, uh, a lot of people can't make it to Tucson for whatever reason during regular shows because of distance or expense. This is another, there's another way to continue engaging. But what I'd like to say about our group, and I think this is um, kind of important. And the reason why the, the guests and people that have signed up is because we're, we're more about educating because this whole subject about responsibility and ethics and, where things come from and, and the UN SDGs and all, there's so many complex things and it is vast and it can be complex and it's quite opaque. And that's because um, in artisanal mining where most of the colored gems in the world come from, at least 80% and, and some of the metals also, uh, that connection to the source is traditionally been opaque for many reasons. Um, but one of the reasons is because people in the past and present that have their sources, they're guarded sources. But I think in the future and going forward, and I think uh, what the responsible uh, theme is about is actually engage, letting those people participate with the world market through our connections and our principles. I think so too. And, and you and I were talking about, um, you know, what does that supply chain look like? What does that mind to market person to person look like? Is it cutting out a middleman um, where, you know, what people are essential in the supply chain? And, and, you know, it is, like you said, it's not really about, it's about creating markets for people in source countries, not cutting them out um, and seeing everybody along equal terms. And I think one thing I was thinking about, I mean, you and I talk a lot, Brian, but one thing I was thinking about before today was, um, and I was talking about a little bit yesterday with Jay, learning from all of you, and especially from you and Eric, who've been doing this a long time. And although for years I've been hearing about, you know, your miners and how you formed co-ops in the, in the, um, you know, formalized people and how involved you are with all the different people on the ground. And then when COVID hit, you know, uh, 
right on the cusp of forming Virtue Gem, there was this obligation that you were feeling to your group that had to leave mining. And, and there's a responsibility that you have. And Eric is in the same way, had, feels the responsibility of the miners that he represents. And now that I'm, you know, sitting in a similar chair to you guys, I fully understand the, the personal responsibility that you feel in helping to, you know, sustain the people in the source country. Who, yeah, I've always, who thought that, I've always thought that the, the middleman or the people that go to the source and collect and buy and buy from the dealers and the aggregators and such, we're in the position where we can direct, you know, energy back to the, the communities. And so that's what, you know, the, the people in this group, that's what we're all doing, you know, in Africa and Sri Lanka, et cetera. And I think that's that's important. The, the other thing, uh, Eric and I were having a conversation yesterday, is that the jewelers and the makers that buy from us, it's, it's not about, it's really not about quantity, it's about quality. Part of the quality is the, you know, the, the caring for the communities and wanting to, to create transparency. Um, you know, stones and gems are, are precious elements. They're sacred, in fact. And, and I think artists, jewelers imbue their work with that kind of uh, impression and care about the materials. It's not like, you know, give me 20 tons of this, I'll take it to China, process it, cut every little thing up and the, sell it for as cheap as I can. Now, I'm not saying that that is, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying that it's not my style. And I think the jewelers and makers that, that want to find stones that, that we offer, I don't, I, I don't think it's their style. It's about creating something special that will be passed on. It's not a throwaway commodity. Um, I guess, you know, uh, I don't know if everyone knows me, but uh, I've been involved in mining and exploration and uh, my passion is with gems and minerals. I just, I just love it. And my family business, our family business, our daughters and my wife, we, we are also designers and cutters and I'm a lapidary artist and we're creative. And, and because of my geology background, really, I think we like to merge science with alchemy. And so there's, there's the magic and then there's the reality. And then there's the experience of mining and understanding what that takes. I think that's um, the way that you cut is an art and it's so unique to you and it's so unique to um, rutilated quartz. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I was saying, I was looking for a different piece. I've been wearing this one all week long that you did that has a star in the center and it's phenomenal, but this one's also unique because it has just one gold band down the center. Mm -hmm. you remember that? And you cut it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just that's clear with that. It's like, that's powerful, you know? And I don't think a lot of, there's not a lot of people that have, you know, take that artistic license to see things in the stones the way that you do. And I think that that's an important thing that, you know, um, brings such individuality to the stone. Yeah. And as you were saying, you know, the people that buy from us, they want to see something different than just calibrated yeah. stuff that you can find everywhere. Yeah, it takes an eye and, you know, we really, almost everything we cut is one off because each stone is unique. But then um, it's like, we can also do production. <laughs> the crystal, that's insane. <laughs> but, but, you know, we love stones. And, and so, you know, just some visuals. This is um, quite a piece. Uh, this is actually from, this is slightly smoky. This is from another region of Brazil. Um, but, you know, we love rocks. We love rocks. Um, besides yeah. uh, the Bahia project, now the community where, where we're mining the rutilated quartz, I actually first went there in 1983. And when I showed up, I was taken out there by a Brazilian 
I didn't even know where we were going. It took two days to drive out there in those days. Now it's about a 10 hour drive, but it was a two day journey. And when I got to the, this tucked away hidden village, it was like, it, they told me that I was the first foreigner they'd ever seen. That was 1983. Um, and then electricity arrived somewhere in the mid nineties, maybe. And since then, in just a short period of time, now it's, you know, everyone's on Wi-Fi and what's up and it's all, you know, it's that happened quickly. And so that's very interesting how quickly things are evolving. And, and I think we're in a position of opportunity to help these remote communities that have resources do something uh, with their resource rather than just struggle and live on a shoestring and, and, you know, we, we can find ways to help them add value to their resource. And whether it's, you know, uh, setting up cutting facilities, teaching how to cut, I mean, things that you're doing, things that Anza Gems is doing. I mean, this is what, this is really what we got to do. Yeah, I think actually I should hit you up to do a little cutting workshop to uh, Malawi and Zambia at some point about you, mm -hmm. how you do it and what you see in Gems. I think we would love to have that. I'm a little guest speaker there. But um, will you talk a little bit about agriculture and about yeah. um, forest safe mining in Bahia? Agri why is that? Why agriculture? Well, agriculture is key to life on Earth. It also happens to be a key to how we're going to deal with the climate crisis. Um, and it's, it's simply about um, you know, growing organic or regenerative agriculture. I really believe in that. And now it's very well known that it, it can be one of the most effective methods to sequester carbon. If we can, um, on large scale and big uh, farm areas, convert to regenerative, that's going to work. But from my scale, from a village scale, or from someone's backyard scale, it's basically teaching the science and the basics of how to grow while regenerating. It's organic farming, basically. But that's what we want to do in Bahia, in this village, is create an educational garden where we bring in the best techniques and we manage water and we replenish the soil. And if you do it right, your soil improves over time and it sucks carbon and keeps it in the soil. So it's a great model. And the, the benefit of that is that garden provides food to that community and it's nutritional food and anyone can do it and you can expand on that and then uh, one of the main things my vision is start growing uh, plants crops medicines spices herbs chocolate uh very, there's some amazing things you can grow especially here uh in in where we're mining uh, and you can create new v avenues of revenue for the community that's based on agriculture, regenerative, and that becomes truly sustainable because our minds sustainable. Yeah. Minds run out. Uh, so you have a community that's mining for generations, decades, Mining quartz, well, guess what? It's getting harder to find. It's deeper, farther away. Um, eventually, that resource runs out or it becomes economically unviable. Then what do you do? So my, my, my message is us, as the people engaging with those communities, finding markets for their products, Let's do something parallel and help them invest in something that will be there in the future. And agriculture just makes so much sense to me because I like good food. Yeah. Right. And it's your head foreman that started the garden, isn't it? Yeah. He's not my head foreman now, but he, yes, for decades we worked together and uh, he has beautiful garden. Actually, before, when we, before we end the session, so everybody doesn't fall asleep. Um, I would like to show <laughs> photos. Um, so, so we'll we'll do some photos um, at the towards the end of the session. I'll just do a quick run through. Yeah, that would be great. Um, 
Yeah, I don't have any photos to run, but um, you know, just to talk a little bit more about this experience has been really nice in the ethical gem suppliers, and we've been having, um, you know, Virtue Gem is new to this, and we've been having kind of the um, different people on in the mornings. We're going to have Percy on after this, who's um, our jeweler in Malawi and does a lot of the export. So I think it's been a nice, you know, yesterday you had a holding up a WhatsApp of your miners, of one of your miners when you were on the phone and we were there together. That was fun. Yes, I, mean, I got a call from my my miner live on WhatsApp and I just showed Susan. She could see right there the rocks and it was, it, it's really interesting and amazing. Uh, you know, Susan, very courageous person. She, she's not afraid of anything. I mean, who, I don't know if you've been to her conference, but if you haven't, you must go to the conference in Chicago. The last one, uh, she calls me and says, Brian, can you bring the chief, you know, <laughs> Chief Miguel from the, the Amazon up to our conference? Like, it's nothing. <laughs> oh, my God. <gasps> it's, the logistics were insane. It, it was a task. But it was insane, was, but they made it and they loved it. And um, both Chief Miguel and Chief Lucas had a blast in Chicago and loved meeting everyone. It was so imagine, fun. Imagine these two guys never out of the Amazon, downtown Chicago on that <clears throat> canal ride. They were having such a good time. Yeah, they did the architectural tour. Oh my God, it's so incredible. Yeah. But, um, uh, Going back to the Amazon, the reason why I connected with them is because of a really interesting project uh, I've been engaged with, a uh, scoping study, looking for a resource for Swarovski who uses Topaz. Now there's a big company that needs to, to demonstrate that they're not buying goods from, you know, they need to know where it comes from. They ask their sources, where, where does your Topaz come from? And their suppliers said, we're not telling, <laughs> right? That was a simple right. answer. Uh, so they, you know, they realized they had to find it. And it, it, it took, you know, three years to do this study. And, and I located um, the best source happened to be in the Amazon. And we found a legal operating mine area with a traditional uh, industry of mining tin for decades. Well, the, the tin is concentrated, weathering out of the granites into these ancient accumulations. And so, you know, it was a very rich deposit of cassiterite. You just pick it up, scoop it up in the sand and process it simply. Well, one of the byproducts was topaz because the topaz was also coming out of the granites. So that became a, a, a very important source. And so, and Swarovski, uh, one of the leading companies in this kind of work decided that, yes, after that, indeed, let's invest in regenerative agriculture. And I began working with some amazing people in the Amazon. There's a lot going on positive in the Amazon right now. Uh, and, you know, that's a whole nother discussion about reforestation, protecting the forest, what's going to happen, uh, carbon credits, et cetera, et cetera. But the topaz is really interesting. It's beautiful. Yeah, um, well, they actually, Swarovski uh, sponsored Chief Miguel and Chief Lucas coming to the conference. So that was really fantastic. And um, I have been wanting to have them talk about the Topaz project. And of course, with this year, we virtually didn't do it. There's too much turmoil. But you can, um, just another gem source out there, you can actually buy the Topaz um, from Swarovski on their site. And it's really cool. I mean, it, the clear topaz is amazing and we should, you know, there's so many, as a designer, there's so many cool ways to use it. And then they also do their special, um, the way that they do color it, which is a treatment, but they have some, you know, very fancy special, I don't know, treatment. Yeah, so, they um, with that. so that's how they do their thing. But um, yeah, they, uh, it's actually mind blowing. They, it's not irradiating the topaz, which I like. So they're taking colorless topaz which has a beautiful dispersion. It's a pretty dense, high refractive index. It's a great, even colorless, it's a great alternate, it's a great headlights for your colored stones, you know? And um, they have a technique so they can, they make it in any color 
it's, so I, I think it's really interesting. And, and by, for example, just like Virtue Gems or Anza Gems, by buying gems from them in that product, it directly supports the projects that are going there. Now they're a much bigger scale, so the, the project is bigger. But, you know, I think, you know, any company that is finding ways to add value and give back to a community, especially if it's related to environment and communities, that's, that's where we're at. Yeah, I think it's good. And I think that, um, you know, you're right in that area, as we all know, everything going on in the Amazon is just vital to our Earth's survival. So yeah. <laughs> anything we can do to help. It sure um, is. Oh. Do you want to do your uh, photos and we can talk through those too? Sure. And I, I, will, I will share some photos. I want to make a couple suggestions uh, in this platform. What I found very interesting that not everyone goes to is the arena. And in the arena, in the arena area, each company has uh, their banner. When you click on that, you will see resources. And those resources will click to whatever links that they put up. So play with those. For example, in, in our arena, there you'll see a banner that says links. You click on that, and it goes to link tree. And there you have links to all our websites. And I've included something you could find very uh, useful. I call it uh, educational resources. And in there, I have links to Sibjo, Responsible Sourcing Book. I have, you know, a lot of the questions that people ask, well, you know, what does fair mind mean? So there's a link to that website. So that's a resource. So do that. Uh, I, I encourage you to explore the arenas. And of course, the lounge is where we're going to be after this talk. So. I'm going to uh, share some photos and we will keep talking as we get to Reti here. And I'm going to, hang on, almost there. I think what, I think what would be, oops, sorry. I think what would be interesting for uh, people to see is the journey to the mine. Uh, let's see, application window. That one. That one. Okay. So you'll also notice in the upper right of the window, you can expand the screen if you want to see the full photo. So is that up? Can you guys see? Can any? Can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see the screen and we oh, can see perfect. a little picture of you in the corner. Okay, su super. So well, good. Looks great. So I think it would be interesting to see what it's like to journey out to the mine. Of course, you must fly into the capital of the state of Bahia, which is the beautiful city of Salvador. It sits on an enormous bay, much larger than San Francisco Bay. It's because of the Bay, it is the oldest city in Brazil. It was the original capital of Brazil. We suggest at least a couple of days of acclimating to the climate before we head out into the interior. I'm there. And then I'm sure that was looking pretty good right now. Uh, so as, we, as you drive out there, again, I said it's about a 10 hour drive now, uh, you cross the northeast part of Brazil through the desert type of region of Brazil called Caatinga. And then you hit a high plateau, which catches rain. Uh, so it's definitely a good spot to take a break and go for a swim. It's also one of the most exotic biomes that I've ever seen in the world. So this is in the Chapada Diamantina. It is the uh, it is the plateau where diamonds were discovered in Brazil. Brazil was the largest producer of diamonds uh, before South Africa discovered diamonds. So here we are in the Chapada and we head, keep heading west and you get into these amazing mountains and valleys. And so where the rutilated quartz is found is on the western edge of this plateau. 
this is uh, in a mine camp. So where the rutilated quartz is found, it's on a particular mountain range that runs about 70 kilometers north-south by about 12 kilometers wide. And it's super unique. That's why we get the rutilated quartz, the golden rutile, in quantity is because that mountain range is a very old volcanic complex, uh, 1.7 billion years old with very interesting elements, rare earths and there's gold and there's other minerals. So the miners are scattered up and down this mountain range. Now, when I first uh, legalized my claim, it was the first one to ever get formalized. Uh, soon after that is when we were able to bring in and introduce the fact that you need to use protective equipment. Uh, up until 10 years ago, nobody used anything. Now, pr many people do, but it's still lacking. So I'm, I have, uh, I'm working with Jill Irwin. She's in the UK. She's a, a wonderful woman. She has a, a wonderful store called She's Lost Control, but she's created a, a company. It's a Crystal Clear Collective. It's a CIC, which is a community interest company. And she created that because she is donating uh, a percentage of sales of crystal from anywhere in the world to our initiative. And because of her, we've been able to be purchasing this type of dust protection, which is you need when you're mining at the front. And we've also been uh, helped during the COVID bringing food relief. Once, once we established a cooperative, it took more time, but now this is, you're looking at a, uh, this is an explosives cache. It's highly regulated by the military police, but you have to go through this process so that you can legally use explosives. And this is, it took a long time to set this up, but this is monitored by cameras and there's alarm systems and every, every blasting cap, every bit of dynamite has to be registered and logged where it came from, where it's going. And it's, it's pretty important because there's a big problem in Brazil of illegal explosives blowing up banks. It is like Butch Cassidy, really. This is inside our mine, the Pyramid Mine, which is sits behind the village of Hemedjo. So uh, we have a little cleaner operation, but you can see the rock is very competent. We can cut right through it, tunnels, and when you hit a pocket, you create a room. You can see that dark vein uh, sort of in the background. That's the quartz vein that we were following. When we produced uh, a nice production, nice pocket, worked through the night to, to get everything out. And this is the dump where the tailings are going. So first thing in the morning, as soon as word spread through the village that we had found something, the ladies, come up to go through all the tailings. And they're, so what they are processing and getting all the scraps and crumbs, which is valuable. It has value. And, and of course, they do this all over, uh, you know, across the mountains. And it's, a, it's, it's really, it's kind of cool. It, it, it's a social event, obviously. They're chattering away and having a good time. But everything they find is theirs. And then, you know, then they sell it. And this is one of the, one, of the, um, one of the ways that the ladies can get involved at the mine site. Very few ladies actually uh, are involved in the heavy mining, but this is something they can do. And this is just a scene from the, the village. Uh, I really like this place because the kids are loose, they're free, they're, they play outside, they're not glued to TVs or computer screens. Although WhatsApp is definitely a, yeah, a social uh, application that everybody's into, but it's, it's, it's a great environment. This is what part of the garden looks like, and, and from here we'll expand in the direction you're looking. We're in the valley, this is right in the village. Uh, what a place to create an educational garden. 
And to the left up on the hillside is where we'd like to build Adobe type um, facilities for visitors. Because I think uh, a lot of people that are tuned in would love to visit a place like this and have a, a comfortable place to stay and hang out in the village and, and get educated about what we're doing, how to grow good food and how to eat good food and how to drink good um, cachaça, which is manufactured down the valley by artisanal cachaça producer. All these things are part of the, of, are part of it. Uh, this is from Jill. We have food, uh, which we're distributing to the elderly and to the remote families that need it. And I just wanted to finish with sunrise this morning in Tucson, because that's where we're broadcasting from. And uh, I know, I wish you were all here. In 2022, we will get together. And I, I, I'm going to uh, end it here. That's a beautiful sunrise. I look forward to, uh, well, of course, getting to Bahia when possible and yeah. checking out all the awesome work. But to seeing you uh, in Tucson again soon. You know, I, I predict that as, as we go forward, a lot of the trade shows are going to morph or dissolve or reduce. It's a, it's a very tricky thing, but I predict that the one trade show that will continue well into the future is the Tucson show. Because it's not just a, a trade show in a convention center, it's an experience. It's a culture. It's there's so many things that you can do here while you're visiting the show. Well, I love it. I'm a big fan of that show. And it is it is so um, an equalizer internationally in who can attend because you do see miners from all over the globe that are there that, um, you know, yeah. at all different levels of uh, within the trade. So it's amazing. So uh, um, thanks for whoever tuned in. Um, Thank you. Take advantage now to hop around all the tables. You may see friends that you haven't seen for months sitting at a table. So this is a really cool way to, you know, it, it, I like it. So we'll see you at the, um, at the tables. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Susan.